In this lecture, we'll look at generative modeling, the business of training probability models that are too complex to give us an explicit density function over our feature space, but that do allow us to sample points. If we train them well, we get points that look like those in our dataset. Here is the example we gave in the first lecture, a deep neural network from which we can sample highly realistic images of human faces. In the rest of the lecture, we will use the following visual shorthand. The diagram on the left represents any kind of neural network. We don't care about the precise architecture, whether it has one or a hundred hidden layers and whether it uses fully connected layers or convolutions. We just care about the shape of the input and the output. And the image on the right represents a multivariate normal distribution. Think of this as a contour line for the density function. We've drawn it in a 2D space, but we'll use it also as a representation for MVNs in higher dimensional spaces. If we're talking about the standard multivariate normal distribution, we'll draw it as a circle around the origin. And if we're talking about a non-standard multivariate normal distribution, we'll draw it as an ellipse somewhere in space. A plane neural network is purely deterministic. It translates an input to an output, and it does the same thing every time with no randomness. So how do we turn this into a probability distribution? We have a few options. The first option is to take the output of the neural network and to interpret that as the parameters of a probability distribution. In this case, the parameters of a multivariate normal distribution. If we represent a distribution in this way, it's always a conditional distribution. We get a probability on our output space, but conditioned on the input value x. If we change x, we get a different distribution on the output space. If the output are the parameters of a normal distribution, then this is the distribution we're learning. This principle is not new. In neural network classification, the standard approaches we've seen also have the neural network producing the parameters for a probability distribution on the output space. If we have two classes, it's a Bernoulli distribution, and if we have multiple classes, it's a categorical distribution. Even regression, as we saw in the previous lecture, can be thought of as providing the mean for an error distribution, and in that case, the maximum likelihood objective is equivalent to training by squared errors. We just don't provide the variance of the output distribution in that case, only the mean. If we do provide both the mean and the variance of the output distribution, it looks like this for an n-dimensional output space. We simply split the output layer in two parts and interpret one as the mean and the other as the covariance matrix. Since representing a full covariance matrix would grow very big, we usually assume that the covariance matrix only has non-zero values on the diagonal. That way, the representation of the covariance requires as many arguments as the representation of the mean, and we can simply split the output into two halves. Equivalently, we can think of the output distribution as putting an independent one-dimensional Gaussian on each dimension, with a mean and a variance provided for each. The only thing we need to be careful about is choosing our activations. For the mean, we should use a linear activation since it can have any value, including negative values. The values of the covariance matrix need to be positive. To achieve this, we often exponentiate them. We'll call this an exponential activation. An alternative option is the soft plus function. This has the benefit of growing a little less explosively than the exponential activation. Here's what that looks like for a network that generates images. The output of the neural network consists of two three tensors. On the left, the three tensor containing a mean for every pixel of every channel in the image. And on the right, the three tensor containing the corresponding variances. If we look at what that tells us about the red value of the pixel at coordinate 8, 7, we see that we get a univariate Gaussian with a particular mean and variance. The mean tells us the network's best guess for the red value of that pixel, and the variance tells us how certain the network is about this output. We should note that neural networks by default are very bad at estimating how certain they should be, so we should take this variance value with a grain of salt. 
Given an output distribution, we can simply train to maximize the log likelihood of our data. For many output distributions, this leads to loss functions that we've seen already. A Bernoulli distribution leads to binary cross entropy. A categorical distribution leads to categorical cross entropy. A normal distribution with only the mean specified leads to mean squared error loss. And a Laplace distribution with only the median specified leads to mean absolute error loss. The loss function for a normal distribution with a mean and a variance is a modification of the squared error loss. We can set the variance larger to reduce the impact of the squared errors. But if we do so, we pay a penalty of the logarithm of sigma. If we know we're going to get the output value for instance i exactly right, then we will get almost no squared error and we can set the variance very small, paying little penalty. But if we're less sure, then we expect a sizable squared error and we should increase the variance to reduce the impact a little bit. If we want to go all out, we can even make our neural network output the parameters of a Gaussian mixture. This is called a mixture density network. All we need to do is make sure that we have one output node for every parameter required and to apply different activations to the different kinds of parameters. The means, as we saw before, get a linear activation and the covariances get an exponential activation. The weights need to sum to one, so we need to give them a softmax activation. If we want to train this network with maximum likelihood, we encounter this sum inside of a logarithm function again, which is difficult to deal with. But this time, it's not such a headache. As we noted in the last lecture, we can work out the gradient for this loss. It's just a very ugly function. Since we're using backpropagation anyway, that needn't worry us here. All we need to do is to work out the local derivatives for functions like the logarithm and the sun, and those are usually provided by systems like PyTorch and Keras anyway. The mixture density network may seem like overkill, but it's actually very useful in cases where we have multiple valid outputs for one particular input. Consider the problem of inverse kinematics in robotics. We have a robot arm with two joints, and we know where in space we want the hand of the arm to be. The question is, what angles should we set the two joints to? This is a great application for machine learning. It's a relatively simple, smooth function, it's easy to generate examples, and explicit solutions are a pain to write and not robust to noise in the control of the robot. So, we can solve it with a neural net. The inputs are the coordinates where we want the hand to be, x1 and x2, and the outputs are the two angles of the joints, theta1 and theta2. The problem we now run into is that for every input there are two solutions, one with the elbow up and one with the elbow down. A normal neural network trained with a mean squared error loss would end up not picking one or the other, but it would average between the two. A mixture density network with two components can fix this problem. For each input, it can simply put its components on the two valid outputs. The problem here is that the task is uniquely determined in one direction. Every configuration of the robot arm leads to a unique point in space for the hand but not when we try to reason backwards from the hand to the configuration of the joints. This often happens when you take a trivial regression problem and flip around the inputs and the outputs. Here's a simpler example so that we can visualize this in action. For every input x, there is a unique output t, subject to a little noise. A small network easily finds a nice fit. However, if we flip around the values of x and t, the problem becomes really difficult. For an input like 0.4, there are two distinct regions that both have a high density of points. The network can only predict one output value, so it ends up averaging between the two, putting the output in a part of space where there is no data at all. If we are training with mean squared error loss, we can interpret the output value as the mean of a normal distribution. We can give the neural network control over the variance of this distribution as well, but all that achieves is that the variance grows to cover both groups of points, but the mean stays in the same place, in between the two clusters. By contrast, the mixture density network can output a distribution with two peaks. This allows it to cover the two groups of points in the output, and so solve the problem in a much more useful way. The general problem we see in the middle picture is called mode collapse. 
and this will be an important concept in the rest of the lecture. If our data is spread out in space, in a complex clustered pattern, and we fit a simple unimodal distribution to it, that is a distribution with one peak, the result is a distribution that puts all the probability mass on the average of our points, but very little probability mass where the points actually are. Mixture models go some way towards letting us capture more complex distributions on our output space. But when we want to capture something as complex as the distribution on images representing human faces, they are still insufficient. A mixture model with k components gives us k modes. So in the space of images, we can pick k images to give high probability, but then the rest is just a simple Gaussian shape around those k points. And the distribution of human faces is better thought of as having infinitely many modes that should all be equally likely. To achieve a distribution this complex, we need to use the power of the neural net, not just to choose a finite set of modes, but to control the whole shape of the probability function. Which brings us to option two. We put the probability at the start of the network instead of at the end of it. We sample a point from some straightforward distribution, usually a standard normal distribution, and we feed that point to a neural net. The result of these two steps is a random point, so we've defined another probability distribution. We call this construction a generator network. Compare this to how we defined parameterized multivariate normals in the previous lecture. We started with a normal distribution and we applied a linear transformation. This is the same thing, but we've replaced a linear transformation by a nonlinear one. To see what kind of distributions we might get when we do this, let's try a little experiment. We wire up a network as shown in this image. A two-node input layer, followed by 12 100-node fully connected hidden layers with ReLU activations, and a final transformation back to two points. We don't train this network. We just use Chloro initialization to pick the parameters and then sample some points. Since the output is two-dimensional, we can easily scatter plot the resulting set of points. Here's a plot of 100,000 points sampled this way. Clearly, we've defined a highly complex distribution. Instead of having a finite set of single points as modes, we get strands of high probability in space and sheets of lower but still non-zero probability. Now remember that this network hasn't been trained, so it's not representing anything meaningful, but it does show that the kinds of distributions we can represent in this way is a highly complex family. And we can also use this trick to generate images. A normal convolutional net starts with a low channel high resolution image and slowly decreases the resolution by max pooling while increasing the number of channels. Here, we reverse the process. We shape our normally distributed input into a low resolution image with a large number of channels. And then we slowly increase the resolution by upsampling layers and decrease the number of channels. We can use regular convolutions here or deconvolutions, which are convolutions where one patch in the output is wired to a single node in the input. Both approaches give us effective generator networks for images. And of course, we can also do both. We sample the input of a network from a standard multivariate normal and interpret the output as the parameters of a probability distribution. We will refer to both the previous kind of network and this kind of network as generator networks. So the big question now is given a generator network, how do we train it? Given some data, how do we set the weights of the network so that the outputs start to look like our examples? We'll start with what doesn't work. Here is a naive approach. We simply sample a random point, for instance a picture, from the data, and then sample a point from the model we see how close they are, compute a loss between them, and we backpropagate. And for the loss, we can use anything like mean squared error or binary cross entropy. If we implement the naive approach, the result is mode collapse. Here's an example. The blue points represent the modes, the likely points of the data. And this green point is generated by the model. It's close to one of the blue points, so the model should be rewarded. But we pick the point that we compare it to at random. So the pair of points that we compute the loss over is actually far apart. On average, even if we generate good points that are close to the points in our data, 
They're much more likely to be paired up with points that are far away, which leads to a high loss. The result is that the output of the network is always pulled into the middle of this distribution. In other words, the many different modes of the data distribution end up being averaged or collapsing into a single point. So we're back to mode collapse. Even though we have a probability distribution that is able to represent highly complex multimodal outputs, if we train it like this, we still end up producing a unimodal output centered on the mean of our data. So how do we get the network to imagine details instead of averaging over all possibilities? There are two main approaches. Generative adversarial networks, which train an adversary to tell fake from real data, and variational autoencoders, which train an encoder to tell us which data point a generated point should be compared to. And these are the methods that we'll discuss in the rest of the lecture, starting in the next video with generative adversarial networks.